Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel and in this video we're going to cover IV fluids. I'll be going through each of the common IV fluids used in the hospital. Important things to know about each one, when to use each. I feel like this is a very confusing topic, especially early on, so it's good to have a foundation of knowledge in which to base your fluid choices on. So before we jump into each of the individual fluid types, I want to talk about treating fluids like we would treat any other medication. So you not only have to know which fluid to use, you also need to know how much of it to use and for how long. And to do that, things like your BMP can guide you, and MDCalc has some excellent calculators for things like maintenance fluid rates, free water resuscitation rates, which are used very commonly in the hospital setting. Another thing to note if you're in a hospital setting is that nurses will track fluid resuscitation through ins and outs charts. But the intravascular effect or the volume repletion of a fluid can vary widely depending on which one you use. So if we're using essentially D5W, which is water because the dextrose gets metabolized, the D5 is really only there so that the water doesn't um, hemolyze your blood. Three liters of D5W has about the same intravascular volume resuscitation as one liter of NS. And the reason for that is that the water distributes more evenly throughout your tissues, and NS has some of that osmotic pressure through the electrolytes, sodium and chloride, and it'll keep more of that volume intravascular. And the interesting thing that we'll, we'll note about NS too, also just jumping ahead a little bit, is that out of one liter of NS, only about one quarter of that remains in the blood vessel. So you're only getting an effective 250 mils intravascular repletion, okay? So we're gonna discuss a few preliminary things before we jump into the, each of the fluids. Before starting fluids, again, we're gonna look at a few key factors, and I think these are readily available most times in a hospital setting and will help you. So you look for volume responsiveness with something like a cheetah scan. You can also take a look at the IVC. If you have an ultrasound available to you, remember the key parameters for the IVC are 2.5 centimeters. If it's greater than that, it's overloaded. And also if it's non-collapsible to greater than 50% or 50% at least with respiration, you have a sign of potential fluid overload and I would avoid too much excess fluid in those kinds of patients. The sodium can be an indicator along with hematocrit. If those go up, then you could be dehydrated. The chest x-ray can show you things like pulmonary congestion, which is a useful clue for volume overload. The bladder scan can show you volume retention. So if the bladder is filled with uh, urine, you could have things like BPH, which are causing you to retain fluid. The echo is extremely useful and I would use it in every case. If you have a heart failure patient, you have to be more careful about going too excessive on the volume resuscitation. Most of these people require uh, a good amount of diuresis. Now jumping into fluid selection. So fluid selection, sometimes there's clear cut recommendations that you can find on up to date for which fluid to use. And sometimes it's a little bit more of an art, but in order to help you select the right one, here's some things to consider. Is this a fluid we're gonna use for resuscitation or just for maintenance? What is the diagnosis of the patient? What is their glucose and electrolytes look like on their BMP? What is their serum osmolarity? We'll see that the osmolarity of these fluids vary and can vary pretty widely. And are they acidotic or alkalemic? Jumping in, we have NS and LR, our isotonic favorites in the hospital. These are great use cases for volume resuscitation. So we have a patients who are either vomiting, have diarrhea, insufficient intake, septic, or have had blood loss and we need to get volume back into them. Isotonics like NS and LR are very useful here. Let's go through the differences and why you would use one over the other. So NS is slightly hypertonic, but for, mo for argument's sake, we can treat it as an isotonic solution. And the chloride in NS is really what's gonna cause us issues. So the chloride causes hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. This can even bump up your potassium a little bit. And <clears throat> even though you know NS doesn't have potassium in it, it can also cause AKI because the chloride has a negative impact on GFR in the kidneys. Kidneys actually use chloride to sense uh, flow. So if the chloride is very high, the kidney will uh, reduce the GFR to compensate because it's thinking it's receiving too much volume, too much flow. All right, so it tricks the kidney. 
So chloride is bad in excessive amounts because NS has a lot more chloride than our blood does. All right, so in order to compensate for this, you know, slightly unbalanced crystalloid or unbalanced crystalloid of NS, LR was invented, which has some other things in it. It has lactate, it has calcium in it, and it's more closely resembles our blood plasma than NS does. It's preferable in ICU patients because it's shown improvement in mortality, especially in those that are renally compromised. Chloride bad for kidneys, chloride bad for acidosis. LR is preferred. <coughs> now, the one thing that there's a few case situations where you would choose NS over LR, and I'm going to go through them now. So for just memory's sake, mostly go with LR. Do not go with LR if you have someone with cerebral edema because this fluid is slightly hypotonic and you don't want to make that edema worse. Um, the other thing you want to avoid with LR is patients that have hypercalcemia. There are no good studies showing that LR makes hypercalcemia worse, but since it does have calcium, why take the risk? You can just go with NS instead. Okay, so another thing is uh, the lactate in LR you know, people will say, oh, that's going to make my acid acidosis worse. Now, the lactate's used as a buffer. It's going to be helpful in the solution to keep the acid-base balance of the blood uh, more neutral, which NS doesn't do. And that, if the liver is working fine, that lactate does not convert to lactic acid. Now, if you have a per pa patient who uh, has hepatic hypoperfusion or liver damage, the lactate can contribute to uh, an acidotic state, but you'd really have to have a good amount of hepatic impairment. So cases to avoid LR in cerebral edema, hepatic hypoperfusion, and hypercalcemia. Those are the three. If those aren't present, then I would usually pick LR over NS because I don't like having the acidotic effect, potentially bumping my K in a renally sensitive patient that already has a high likelihood for hyperkalemia in, in ESRD patients, hyperkalemia is a problem. And I don't want to make my GFR lower in these patients as well. Now jumping back to something we already touched on earlier in the video, which is intravascular volume repletion. This is one of our main use cases for our isotonic fluids. And it's important to remember for our isotonic fluids of that one liter that we give, only one fourth or 250 mils stays intravascular because of how water is distributed throughout the body. Now, if we use something like D5W, which has no effective osmols, only 8% of that stays intravascular. So we're not using D5W for volume repletion. We use it to re replace free water in hypernatremic patients. But for volume, it's really terrible. Now, this goes back to the basic science concept of osmolarity and tonicity, where tonicity is the effective osmolarity of our solution. So it's how easy is if something has osmolarity, it draws water to it. But tonicity is how that molecule moves across cell membranes. And to elaborate on this example is sodium is an effective osmol because it tends to stay on one side of a cell membrane rather than another and we have active transporters to balance it. Urea, on the other hand, is an ineffective osmol because it moves freely across membranes. So it doesn't do anything, so its tonicity is poor. Now that we've covered NS and LR, let's jump into the D5W. It's a great fluid for hypoglycemia and hypernatremia. And this fluid, the dextrose in it, is really used so when it's injected into you, it's isotonic and it doesn't hemolyze your red cells. But after some time, after the dextrose gets metabolized, you really have a hypotonic solution. And it's, that's why it's so great for patients with hypernatremia. A few things that get confused with this uh, fluid is that it has a good amount of sugar, a good amount of nutrition, and it really doesn't. It, there's 50 grams of dextrose in one liter of D5W. That's about 170 calories or two candy bars. You're really not going to be able to keep someone nutritionally calorically positive with D5. Uh, and the other thing that you want to consider when D5W is, oh, I have a diabetic patient. Can I still use D5W in correcting their hypernatremia? And the answer is yes, you can, because the sugars we can easily fix with insulin. Uh, 
but the sodium, we really need to replenish their free water. And if they're not able to take PO free water, this is really your only choice. You'll just have to bump up the insulin and give them D5W. All right, so those are two common myths. Now, the other one that we commonly look at is, was, will this cause pulmonary edema? Will the free water, because remember, 8% of this stays intravascular, the rest goes throughout the body. Uh, will this cause me to have pulmonary edema in my patient? Well, pulmonary edema has been studied, and it looks like hydrostatic pressure is the main driving force for pulmonary edema. And since this fluid does not really stay inside the vasculature, you're not going to have an issue with pulmonary edema in D5W uh, receiving patients. Now, for the rest of these fluids, I'm going to go through them a little more quickly because they're more fringe use cases and we can do individual videos on them if you guys like this video and uh, want more of this. So 3% NS is one of those fluids you'll see in, in the neuro ICU with patients with cerebral edema. You'll see it with severe symptomatic hyponatremia. Okay, so that's a sodium of less than 120, which is pretty low. And then it, the sodium is either continuing to drop rapidly or has caused seizure or coma. That's what I'm talking about when I mean symptomatic, okay? So 3% NS is used in those cases. If the sodium is severe enough or it causes symptoms, that's the main use case. Otherwise, normal saline usually does it for sodium repletion in these patients. It's also commonly used in this cardiac ICU with Bumex, or, which is a diuretic, to help draw fluid out of the tissues and help the patient pee it out in heart failure patients, okay? so. Heart failure patients, patients with cerebral edema, and patients with severe hyponatremia that's symptomatic usually get uh, at least a little bit of 3% NS. On the other end of our spectrum, as opposed to 3% hypertonic saline, we have half NS, which is hypotonic. And this is really used for hypernatremia. And uh, if we're comparing it to our other uh, solutions here, we have one liter of NS, 250 of that is staying intravascular. One liter of D5W, 80 mils is staying intravascular. And for our half NS, somewhere in between about 167 mils will stay intravascular. If we're comparing half NS to D5W for hypernatremia, you know, both of these can fix your hypernatremia problem. But the advantage of half an S is that more of it is staying intravascular. So we're also having some volume repletion. You can even use it for uh, maintenance fluids in someone that is mildly hypernatremic. That would be very advantageous. Okay, so half an S, great solution for hypernatremia, especially if you want to boost their volume up a little bit in the process. One of the things that you can see is that you can add D5 to solutions like half an S. So we can make a solution of D5 half an S, which is a hypertonic solution that eventually becomes hypotonic, which is kind of interesting because the D5 gets metabolized and now we're forming a hypotonic solution. And the main use case I see for this in the hospital is in DKA patients. You'll see in the algorithms that after the patient's glucose reaches below 200, uh, you'll throw D5 half an S to volume resuscitate them and keep their sugars stable. Uh, a lot of these fluids going from now on are really more fringe cases. So D5 half an S, you really have to look at what evidence there is for it, if it's recommended in any specific algorithms. Otherwise, uh, this is where the art of medicine comes in. You have to look at your whole patient, everything we discussed in the previous slides, the electrolytes and so forth to make the decision of if D5 half an S is the appropriate fluid for your patient. And D5 can be added to anything. It can be added to NS and LR as well. And these are hypertonic solutions that eventually become isotonic because you know their foundations, NS and LR, are isotonic, unlike half an S, which was hypotonic. Um, this is a good maintenance fluid use for people who have uh, low sugars or hypoglycemic. You can add a little bit of sugar to their maintenance in order to keep them balanced out. Rolling along on our sugar train, we have D10W. Uh, this is a very high uh, sugar concentration. It has about 340 cals of energy in it. And now if we're using D10W, what uh, it's commonly used for is if you don't have D50 injections, if your institution is lacking uh, D51 unit for hypoglycemic patients, 
you can run them a drip of D10W, usually somewhere around 250 mils at 750 an hour, to make an equivalent of about, about one amp of D50. And that's going to help in your hypoglycemic patients. This is a hypertonic solution that eventually becomes hypotonic because the D10 goes away and now you just have water. And now we'll get into our colloid, which is albumin. So albumin is very interesting. It has a great oncotic effect because it's all protein and it's going to pull fluid intravascularly. Okay, so out of all the fluids we've discussed so far, albumin actually has the highest uh, intravascular water pulling effect out of any fluid. So if you give one gram of albumin, it attracts 18 milliliters of water. So if you give 100 mils, of 25 grams of albumin, it's going to expand your intravascular volume by about 450 mils, which is about the equivalent of two liters of saline. So it's a great intravascular expander. It's very commonly used in people who have liver failure, need volume resuscitation to prevent renal dysfunction, um, if they have a large volume paracentesis with, I think, greater than seven liters removed, you're going to use albumin to replete their volume. If they have refractory nephrotic syndrome and very bad nephrotic syndrome, you can also use albumin. So those are the three main use cases. Um, improving renal function in cirrhotics, people with end-stage liver disease, large volume paracentesis, and refractory nephrotic syndrome. And it has an excellent oncotic effect. The one problem and why we don't use it for volume resuscitation commonly in patients is it's because it's extremely expensive. A bag of albumin is about $100 versus a few cents for NS and a little bit more for LR. So uh, it's, a, it's, a cost, it's a cost value ass assessment here. And in studies that have been done so far, it doesn't work a lot better than LR for volume resuscitation anyway. So you're saving money and you're repleting volume better or equivalently with LR and NS instead. Our final fluid that I'm gonna throw in here is packed red blood cells. And uh, this, we usually don't think of it as a fluid. We usually think of it as something we use to replete the hemoglobin. But really one unit of red blood cells has an intravascular effect of about 300 cc's, which is usually equivalent to one liter of LR and S, isotonic fluid. So intravascular repletion with packed red blood cells is really good. It's about the same as one liter of isotonic fluids. Okay, because remember, one liter of LRNS, only about 280 of that is gonna stay intravascular. So the other thing that I think is important to know about PRBCs is they do not act like a colloid, like albumin. Those red cells are not gonna pull extra water in. So what you get in is what you get. You don't get anything extra. And another interesting thing to note is that one unit of red blood cells is commonly known to increase your hemoglobin by one. Now this depends on a whole host of factors though. Sometimes it's not one, sometimes it's gonna be 1.6 or 0.6. And this depends on a few things, and th these might surprise you. It's gonna depend on the size of the patient, which is a little bit obvious. Uh, it's gonna depend if the blood is irradiated or not. Irradiated blood tends to have a lower fraction of repletion and it's gonna depend on who donated the blood. Now, if the person who donated the blood had a higher hemoglobin hematocrit, was a male, usually male blood has higher uh, hemoglobin values, the patient's RBCs or hemoglobin will jump by more. So the donor characteristics are an important factor, but they are unknown to us at the time of transfusion. So it can be a little sporadic. If the patient got one unit of blood yesterday and another unit today, but the donors were different, you can have a different jump in their hemoglobin. And it can be quite drastic. It can be 1.5, 1.6 more. So definitely consider these as extra factors when you're looking for that one-to-one -one increase in hemoglobin to PRBCs given, because it's not always the case. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but it's a good rule of thumb overall. I hope this video was helpful. You learned a little bit more about fluids and you expanded your knowledge about fluid resuscitation in patients. If you have any questions or you'd like to reach out to me, please drop a comment down below and we can discuss this topic further.